Tales from the City, and also we have a great lineup of speakers. So I mentioned that the star of this evening is uh, Petra Marco from Bureau Milk and uh, Pet, uh, Marco and the Pacemakers. We have here also Tilly Lohans from Bio. We have Sean Balog from the City Hall, and we have Aaron Halas also from the City Hall, but uh, from the Climate uh, Office. And you guys, you're all doing a lot of things in Budapest, in Bratislava, in other, other cities to turn our cities more livable, more accessible, more lovable. So uh, this is going to be the topic of tonight. What's what we're going to have? We have a presentation by Petra in the beginning. Uh, please prepare your questions, prepare your doubts, your dilemmas, because we'll have the occasion to talk about uh, many details as well. Then we'll have a little local context uh, kind of match, matching by uh, Tilly Lohas about Wyo's work, which is one of the projects featured in the Real My City book. And then we will have small inputs from Shamu and Aaron about how we stand in Budapest. And then we will have a little roundtable discussion, but again, you'll be, you'll be welcome and you'll be invited to join the discussion and have your questions, your comments, because we are not too many people, so this should be. Uh, quite easy to have a dialogue here. So, um, you also see this furniture, so we are here with this furniture because this event is sponsored by MMCT, uh, uh, indoor and especially outdoor furniture company. So this is, I think it's very good if we can talk about outdoor furniture because this means that we can use outdoor spaces more and more. Also, Bio is building their own furniture, which we see more and more in the city. If you go out in the, uh, in the river bank, you will see more and more of uh, their furniture as well. And also, the center point of this evening is uh, the book called Green My City, which we just published uh, recently. You can buy the book here after the event. We will figure out how. There's still uh, an ongoing discussion about what is the exact way of payment, but we'll find a way. Uh, you can also, I think, take a look at the books, and also you'll find it online if you're interested as well. So without, you know, Losing your time, wasting your time, I would like to invite Petra. Thanks a lot for making it, and we're very curious to hear more about Green Mile City. Thank you very much, Lamenta. Thanks for um, inviting me. Thanks to Aaron, actually, for inviting me uh, to Budapest in the first place. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to introduce Green Mile City, but, but I'm going to um, talk more about you know, the role and value of temporary interventions. You've got some of those happening in Budapest, um, and you are aware of some of the projects that Lamenta already mentioned uh, elsewhere in Europe. And um, when we got together with Martin Jensha, who's sitting here in the first row, uh, who's the founder of Milk, uh, he approached me basically in the spring last year saying, you know, um, this is really important. We feel that as a communication visual design studio, uh, working on place projects, working for private sector developers, but working also for local authorities. We really want to influence um, the content uh, of those projects, and we don't want to make the communication as a packaging, uh, but we want to tell authentic stories. So, uh, Milk works across uh, different types of place projects from very small scale of you know, a restaurant or uh, a street corner through to neighborhoods and big brownfield site or redevelopments um, across Europe. But it is about, uh, in order to tell great stories, we have to make great places. So I'm going to start with a story which is um, very much Martin's story because he was uh, part of it from the outset. And this is a story from Bratislava, where Milk is based, if I forgot to mention that. And it's the story of um, reviving the old market hall in Bratislava. So back in 2012, um, a bunch of friends got together, and uh, actually two of them are here tonight, Martin and, and Gabor, uh, Gabor, further back, um, to reactivate the old market hall. So the old market hall is owned by the city, but it had been empty and unused for many years, and they felt um, it's in a very prominent location, close to the historic center, and they thought, you know, this should be a space for everyone, where everyone is welcome. Um, interestingly, one of those people 
was like the point to works. One of those people in that group is now the mayor of Bratislava running in his second term, uh, he's an architect, Matusz Mauer. So uh, you can see that this group of activists, actually quite a few of them, became very influential in shaping the future of our city. Um, you know, after 1989, uh, there's been a wave of uh, a very uncontrolled development and uh, a lot of mistakes being made. And in the last 10 to 15 years, I would say that the agenda about uh, shared space, public space, uh, and the common good had become more central to the discourse and engaging people uh, in the process of, of creating the city. So um, it was quite a huge task, but it started uh, with seemingly kind of a uh, small once a month pop-up market. So they started to do the pop-up market once a month, and then it became once a week. Then they were able to negotiate with the different stakeholders and with the city um, along these for the building. Uh, they were able to get funding for its refurbishment. And today, um, if you come to Bratislava on a Saturday, it's always passing with the Saturday market. There's lots of free activities also for children. Uh, there's a summer art installation, a free installation, uh, usually very interactive. And there's lots of um, different cultural uh, and art events and concerts and uh, different kinds of things happening there. What is um, most important, I think, for me, as somebody whose uh, background is, is an architect, an urban designer, placemaker, is the fact that um, reviving the old market hall had on the city um, as a whole. So here you can see um, that actually all the street frontages, all the little shops and, and uh, ground floor um, spaces became uh, filled with different programs and uses as a result of activating the market hall. The market hall also pops out uh, on the square in front of it. And eventually the city also ran an international competition for a series of squares linking to the square in front of the old market hall. And you can see its uh, position in the city centre is very, very prominent. Um, and there was a wave um, after 1989 where people kind of deserted the old city centre and it became kind of just this tourist attraction with lots of kind of weird, very expensive shops or kind of odd restaurants that nobody went to. Um, now if you came, came to Bratislava, uh, the historic town centre is full of young people on the weekends and uh, I think that the role of uh, reviving the old market hall has been quite significant in this process. So. Um, the story of the old market hall shows that starting with, you know, temporary intervention, starting to do something instead of saying what the future might look like, um, is a very powerful tool um, in the absence of kind of top-down decision-making, and it generates really long-term value. A lot of minimal projects, temporary interventions, uh, happen in moments of crisis. Um, we've just come out of the back end of one of such crises, um, the pandemic, which, which still affects a lot of the urban fabric with empty uh, offices, with struggling restaurants or retail. Um, and this is really shaping up the way that we um, look at how to make the city. Uh, you will recognize perhaps this image, this is Champs-Élysées in Paris, where the mayor is uh, spearheading the so-called 15-minute city concept. Um, this idea is about having all the services and amenities within walking distance or within short kind of cyclable or public transport distan distance uh, so that you don't have to uh, go around all day um, doing your daily uh, shopping and so on. And um, I spent most of my professional career in London. I've, I've lived there for 15 years and I came back to Bratislava a year and a half ago. And uh, when I was in London in 2008, uh, the financial crisis had really a profound effect on the city. And I think it really had a huge effect, on, particularly on those global cities very exposed to foreign capital. So huge um, capital investment projects were put on hold because of the viability and the changed financial situation. And it was also a big crisis for the profession of architects. So. Um, Lots of architects have lost their jobs and lots of architects had to think 
on their feet and think differently um, how they can create their own commissions, how they can initiate projects themselves, and not just architects, but, but creative and cultural uh, practitioners. And so this is an example uh, from South London on Union Street, where the site was stalled not just for a few weeks or months, but actually for three or four years. And a number of um, temporary interventions every summer happened curated by the Architecture Foundation. Uh, one of them was an urban orchard, and there was a Lido. They had engaged residents uh, from surrounding neighborhoods. They had engaged market traders from Borough Market, which is very nearby on this site. And they had ultimately also influenced the shape of the future of this building, which was built there, which had, um, as you can see, incorporated this cantilever and, and a public square, which wouldn't probably have been the case uh, if those activities did not happen there over the period of uh, several summers. Um, sort of coming back to the topic of um, public assets, this is a seven-story parking garage in South London owned by the local authority. It started to be populated around the time of the financial crisis with sort of pop-up art installations and a bar, and then the local authority ran a competition, architectural competition, uh, to make the levels of the parking garage usable, so it was not used even for parking, it was kind of quite a shady dark space and it was open to the elements. Uh, so Turner Works won the competition and transformed this space into 50 ateliers, 70 co-working spaces. There's also a kindergarten, um, there's communal canteen and various uh, kinds of communal spaces, which really help sort of starting uh, designers, makers to be where their work can be exhibited, where it can be seen by others from within their industry, but also by potential customers. So a really important incubation space in what used to be an empty um, garage. But temporary, the idea of temporarity has been around for hundreds of years. It's not something new. It has just been named, you know, the term meanwhile was, was originates uh, in the UK. Um, and it's actually now a use class in the planning system, so uh, which is also an important point because you can um, you can create different sets of rules and regulations for temporary projects, which can then happen faster. Um, but street markets have been around for hundreds of years, and then in the second half of the 20th century, with the rise of shopping malls and changing retail trends, lots of street markets have sort of nosedived and, and, and almost died. Um, and then in the last 20 years they have seen this revival, so this idea of um, spaces of exchange where we can come together. Uh, on the left top side is my favourite um, market, Columbia Road Flower Market in, in London, which only happens every Sunday uh, and just for half a day. And it completely transforms the street. If you would come here during the week, it's, it's very quiet and nothing much happens. And then on Sunday, it's this kind of oasis um, of flowers. So the reason why people come together in cities, is, as we all know, is it's not just to do the job and, and to buy the stuff, but it's to be together and exchange ideas and experiences. And on the right hand side, you can see um, an example of uh, actually a private piece of land in Prague, which had been transformed um, by a uh, design of Hibi Krzysztof Architects, Czech practice. And if you uh, have very good eyes, you will spot some of the furniture, which is very similar to what we have here in front of us. Uh, so uh, there's the shameful plaque <laughs> of and this lovely furniture and how it can be used um, in this kind of pop-up situation. Uh, meanwhile, projects um, you will all uh, know are very useful and very widely used recently in the last couple of decades in green mobility initiatives, perhaps most significantly the example from transformation of New York City. Um, Times Square, uh, there was a trial with 374 beach chairs, uh, pedestrianizing it just temporarily, that they were gathering, collecting data about how the traffic flows adjusted around. Uh, and they worked out that in fact, you know, fatalities went down, uh, the flow of traffic was better, people spent more time on Times Square, equals people spent more money on Times Square. I mean, we're talking about New York City in America, so we know uh, the system needs to be fueled uh, with the power of money. But uh, 
But the pedestrian trials had really helped to build a case. And then um, they were able to make a big investment and persuade Mayor Bloomberg at the time to make a big investment into permanent project at Times Square. Uh, 70 different junctions were transformed, 650 kilometers of cycle paths were implemented, and um, green mobility is happening also on small on smaller scale, not just at this grand scale like in New York, but we can see um, a lot of uh, school streets happening, and I was just hearing from uh, one of your colleagues here uh, before the talk that the first school streets are now being realized also in Budapest, we started doing it in Bratislava, um, it's happening everywhere, it's been happening in Tirana and Albania, so uh, that's really good news for our part of the world, where, where we generally um, are a couple of steps behind, but at the same time very eager to, 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 to get to do the right thing. Um, Levante mentioned Barcelona and the Superblox, so I assume you're all familiar with it, I think you also had a talk uh, by someone from the city, um, from Barcelona, here at KEG, um, a couple of months ago or weeks ago. Um, what's interesting is this is a city-led initiative, which equals means it's at a big scale, really. So, uh, one at a time, it is just closing off a couple of streets, but over time, it is actually uh, meeting the goal of um, cooling the climate of the whole city. This is a big issue in a city like Budapest, which is very, very hot, but already it is very, very hot in Budapest and in Bratislava. So um, this is a structural uh, use of temporary interventions to affect long-term change, which is, which uh, here another example from Vienna talks about it, but from a different perspective. Gretel Arts is also a city-run program it is encouraging residents uh, to transform their own street, their own neighborhood. Uh, it gives them up to 4,000 euros per project, um, so they can apply with an idea what to make on their street, either a parklet or a space for children, so there's a specific focus also on children in public space. And then they get the financial support and they also get organizational support so they don't have to worry about um, taking up parking places. Uh, this is all done through the process, um, through the program. And what's beautiful is that people actually make the projects themselves. They can see uh, you know, the fruit of their labor, um, therefore they have more um, motivation to also take care of these spaces, uh, to really have a sense of stewardship and maintenance and care of the public space and the shared space. And, I think it's a lovely initiative that shows how a sense of community and inclusion uh, can be fostered uh, in a city in an acupuncture way. So this was a bunch of students who were building their parklet when I visited in Vienna. And if you are, uh, if you happen to be architects or any other urban practitioners involved in meanwhile projects, if you want to get people involved, you have to make it easy to build. So this is an example uh, from London by Assemble. Uh, and they use this very simple thread and block technique so that um, they have 200 volunteers at the end uh, helping to make this installation. 40,000 people had visited over the course of nine weeks. There were different uh, arts and cultural events, performances, uh, cinema, etc. They were selling um, tea for 50p. So they really wanted to make this space very, very accessible. And uh, as a legacy of this pop-up, which finished after nine weeks, the space under the bridge, which before the project was completely closed off by a fence, remained open and it's a very kind of uh, free zone for kids to skate and, and not be supervised or observed or controlled. So important sort of space for teenagers. I'm not going to talk a lot about this project because we've got <laughs> someone here who actually did it all, so I'm really looking forward uh, to hear that. But um, the idea of creating a stage on a bridge or creating a civic space that happens repeatedly and in the bigger scheme of things, the long-term value of uh, Valios um, initiative is to reactivate the waterfront and to rediscover the river Danube in Budapest. And, and it is a very, very wide and wild river uh, once it gets to Budapest. So it's quite a big challenge. It's not 
a tiny river where you can you know, sit and... Um, uh, we're back to London here, so um, a huge uh, brownfield site um, in North London, King's Cross, which has been built out in phases over 20 years. Um, it's almost finished now. You can see on the grey picture there, um, this is King's Cross St. Pancras Station, where people, those two lines, where people would arrive to London and usually go south, go to the centre of London. And the red is the zone um, owned by the railways, which have been closed up for over 50 years, and which is the site of redevelopment. And um, it's a huge mix of scheme with you know, hundreds of housing units, um, Central St. Martin's uh, University, uh, there's also shopping, there's offices, there's Google headquarters, um, and so on. And I mentioned it was built out in phases, but uh, there was also a phased strategy with temporary interventions. The goal of these was to really um, change the perception of people of this space, or, or even sort of discover this space and build a destination. Because as I mentioned, people would come to London and go south, um, and, and they had to kind of funnel them back up and say, look, there's this whole new quarter in the city, 40% of the land is public space um, in the end, in this development. So lots of public space, I should say um, privately owned public space, so there's a disclaimer, but <laughs> uh, this is the reality of, of many cities today where, where the local authorities, the city don't have uh, the resources to uh, upkeep and to manage public space and, and often falls into private hands. So then it's about the building the trust between the developer, the local authority and the stakeholders to achieve the best possible outcome and to make sure that this public space is also public in its use, um, not just um, in the way it's talked about. And they use a lot of um, meanwhile projects. Um, and I'm just going to pick one example because I did talk about this project for uh, the whole evening, but it's the Skip Garden. So the Skip Garden, as it's called, started in skips. It was two skips where the, uh, the vegetables were grown, and then as the development was built out, it had moved to different parts of the development, and it also it had moved, uh, it had grown in its scope. So Global Generation is a charity who started to build this relationship with the developer Argent, who delivered this development, and. As, as, it became, as it became proof of concept and they were doing lots of workshops for, for kids, then they engaged uh, students from the university. They were kind of building it bigger and bigger. And last summer they had signed a 999 year lease with the developer for a permanent spot for the skip garden, which is now called the story garden because of all the different activities and stories that had happened there over the time. Uh, so effectively, uh, part of this uh, privately owned public space is, is now for almost a thousand years in the hands of um, the charitable generation uh, for the skip garden. So there's a story of temporary use which becomes effectively permanent and becomes part of the story of that place. Uh, another example which is um, private led development in South London. Uh, this is just showing in a nice way that you can start by having a street before you have the development. Usually it's the other way around, the way we know it in our context um, in this part of the world, that you know there's a fence for many for several years and then there's a development. So this is a big mixed use uh, site in Elephant and Castle uh, called Elephant Park, around 1200 residential units, mixed use neighborhoods that will come here. And they started uh, working with young Italian architects who used this very cheap um, structure or uh, construction of scaffolding uh, to make, uh, to complement the street. So you've got both sides of the street before uh, you have the development. So at night you're not afraid to walk along, um, especially if you're a woman in London, which has been lately a dangerous affair uh, due to several um, incidents. And um, another benefit, uh, let's say, for, for the investor, for the developer, is building relationships with future occupiers of the retail and business spaces in the ground floor. So, um, as part of the street, there were like three, three um, studios, three spaces 
that uh, where they were trialing the new uses, so they had a local radio station and a flower shop um, and another space which I forgot uh, to use of. But basically, you are starting to be engaged with the surrounding uh, community and with people who might potentially, eventually, when, once you build your permanent project, move into the spaces on the ground floor. We know that for developers these days it's incredibly difficult uh, to fill those retail spaces, to fill the office spaces sometimes uh, because of the result of the pandemic and the challenges that we have post-pandemic. So uh, building those relationships and actually giving those spaces, so at King's Cross that I showed earlier, there they have a, a scheme where they bring in retailers um, temporarily as a pop-up for three or six months where they don't pay rent but they just pay a percentage of their uh, profit from the sale of their products. That's a good way to test um, whether uh, that particular business, business or retailer is going to be successful in your space and then in the long term it's you, you've got a tenant for the long term so it's a win-win <coughs> situation. Um, here we are in Czech Republic on the left hand side in a smaller town, smaller, uh, sort of very, very nice, uh, well preserved historic town, Česka Budějovice, and uh, they have one of the oldest Baroque fountains um, in Czech Republic. They also have a, a city gallery that not many people know is there or it's not very, it doesn't have very good visibility. So the city gallery has commissioned Jan Šerka architects to make um, this temporary installation which had created a bridge between the gallery. Uh, so you had to go into the gallery in order to visit the fountain. And you visited the fountain in this kind of more different, changed perception of it in this more intimate setting where you suddenly are told this is something you should look at and maybe you didn't really notice it before as you were walking past the square. Um, again, some 36,000 people had visited um, and there was a company in program of discussions and talks about the future of the city and about people's relationship to the town. Uh, on the right hand side, um, we are in Sweden, in, in Gothenburg, a city-led uh, harbour redevelopment for, again, uh, many hundreds of uh, new homes that will be built here. And then you started by commissioning Rama Borg from Germany to do uh, this sauna. So this is a pop-up sauna. Uh, it's free for people to visit. And it has created this buzz and people suddenly come to this location that they hadn't been hanging out for, for years and years. And it will be interesting to see how the city uses this as a communication and engagement tool as the development uh, shapes up. I might have mentioned children already, but maybe earlier today I'm getting my talks confused. But um, this is something that's really um, close to my heart, um, the topic of children and young people in public space, particularly teenage girls in public space. And here is an example uh, where you can see that also brands can stand behind meanwhile temporary projects. So uh, Pika and Nike are doing these pop-up basketball courts all over the world. Uh, one of them uh, on the top is in Beijing, and this is particularly focused at female uh, athletes and at teenage girls. Uh, I'm saying that because if you went to a typical basketball court in London, it would have quite high brick walls, it would have only one entrance, it would be a little bit intimidating and wouldn't feel very safe for a girl to enter uh, that space during the day or particularly in the evening. So you can see um, this pop-up basketball court, the way that they dealt with the visibility, with the materials, that is transparent, is well lit, again, a series of activities and program around it to bring those girls to that space. And um, different but similar initiatives in Barcelona, Equal Playgrounds, uh, run by this feminist group Equal Sara, uh, who have sort of pointed to the problem of uh, primary school um, playgrounds or external spaces, courtyards, where 70% of those spaces is taken up usually by a football court. Uh, what they are doing is a series of workshops to shake up things and create different opportunities for different types of play in the schoolyard, 
where also girls can take part. Um, I mean, of course, girls can also play football, but it tends to be more on the boys. This is not taking the football away from the schoolyard, but it's just at different times of the day creating a space where more girls will hang out, because we know that girls generally, the older they get, the less um, time they spend outdoors for, for various reasons. And again, we just talk about it for a long time. But um, another project in Prague, um, where it's a series of art passes that was transformed into a skate park, um, and it's a kind of free zone for kids to roam around. Sense of belonging and inclusion um, can be created quite instantly. Um, inspired by the Bryant Park chairs in New York, um, these um, sort of chairs and, and tables uh, we can see now in Bratislava, we can see them in Prague and other cities around the world. The idea is that they are just freely scattered around uh, public spaces in the city. They are not part of um, a restaurant or a bar, so you don't have to buy anything. You can just simply go there and sit there. You can bring your own food, etc. And in Bratislava, they have really revived um, quite a few spots, and they have grown in scope as well. Uh, there is actually very little evidence of them being stolen, so this was initially always the fear of the local authority. You now somebody will, will, of course, take them away. Uh, this is almost never the case. Uh, there's little shops or institutions on the ground floor that usually take care of them and they bring them indoors for the night. So again, this sense of stewardship that builds over time. And um, with the issue of migration, which has been a, an issue for, uh, uh, for hundreds of years, but, but more recently also uh, because of the war in Ukraine and before that because of what's been happening in Syria, uh, it's important to think about people migrating and what are the facilities and public spaces that they can actually use. So this example from Tel Aviv, um, the Garden Library, is a collaboration of a local charity with uh, a, a local NGO with the local authority. And they create this free space uh, where no questions are asked. Uh, when migrants come into a new uh, country, they don't automatically immediately have their social security numbers, etc. and so on. Therefore, they can't really actually visit a lot of the public services, like the library, for instance. So this is a library where people uh, and families with their kids can come together, where they can build relationships, where they can get help uh, with getting themselves organized and, and educated while they're waiting for their children to be placed into, into schools. So all of the projects that I showed are talking about creating welcoming places and this has been our mission at Milk with, with the Places team, kind of uh, making those good projects visible and, and um, making, them, making them popular, but also helping to shape them. And uh, I'll refer back to uh, my favorite Jane Jacobs. Uh, I'm sure many of you know of her. She, as an activist in the 60s in New York City, had fought um, to safeguard uh, the idea of uh, lively streets and mixed-use neighborhoods in New York City. And uh, she was going to the term eyes on the street. So a lively street is one where uh, there's things happening different times of the day where if something was up, then there would be someone else who would be observing it and would prevent bad things happening. Um, and one of the quotes, many quotes of her that you can find is that there is no logic that can be superimposed on the city. People make it and it is to them, not buildings. We must fit our plans. So she really came with this very people-centered perspective, um, how we think about uh, living and working and playing in cities. And this is what we have tried to uh, collect together in the Meanwhile City book, showing that all these small temporary interventions actually can have long-term uh, effect and, and can be very powerful in transforming uh, cities into better places and welcoming places. Uh, it is on purpose made very accessible. Uh, this is not an industry publication. This is a book for anyone to pick up. Um, it's currently sold at uh, various bookshops across the UK, in Bratislava, Broad Book Study, and it is 
uh, unfortunately, Levant Dimension, we just published it, but we did publish it in October, and uh, the current uh, print run is, is almost out. So uh, these are some of the very last copies, but we hope to have uh, the next print run very soon. Uh, we've got four main case studies, and then we've got a series of thematic smaller case studies. What I would recommend if you look at the book is to read the three interviews, which we have at the very beginning. They are with an architect, with a developer, and with somebody from a city, a city representative. So they are the three perspectives that, um, of, of three people who are, I think, all extremely knowledgeable and very experienced in, in their field about the role and value of uh, meanwhile projects. And you can also uh, get a free online copy, a digital copy, so this is freely accessible online on, on meanwhile.city. And as I mentioned, there's a few copies here, I'd like to mention, we'll, we'll work out how, if, if anyone wants to buy them, how, how we'll do that. Uh, and hopefully there will be more sold soon. So to uh, conclude, um, what are temporary interventions or meanwhile projects for? Uh, they can help us build active places with strong identity. They can help engage um, local residents or future users in the case of developing on a brownfield site where nobody lived before. They uh, can build that engaged community and you, you heard the story of the skip garden which I think is quite relevant to that. They can help build trust between the city, the local, uh, between the city, the developer, and the residents or citizens. Um, they can test future uses, and they can also build momentum uh, in order to persuade and lobby the different stakeholders or uh, the government or an investor to invest into the long-term project. Um, and I think that all the rest we already covered. Uh, there's a couple of disclaimers from the different interviews that we have done with people and uh, some of the things that they had said were that they should not be driven solely by marketing objectives. This is not to say that there shouldn't be any marketing objectives and especially if you're working for private clients, they will have those. But it's about working towards a win-win for all. It's about, if we are talking about the city, we're talking about um, the common good, we're talking about uh, a place where very different people come together. So if we are doing a project, it always has impact on its context. And um, the important thing is that any project that we make in the city is additive, that it adds, adds the value. So you don't have to buy a flat there or you don't have to go and eat in the restaurant. But perhaps even if this place is on your route to your work or to your school or whatever, once it's done, you might think, oh, it's better than it was before. I really like the fact that they did this. So you don't even have to be part of it. So, so sort of, that's the idea of being win-win to all. So you're not necessarily creating projects for everyone at every time. You know, there are different kinds of projects and some are extremely inclusive and some are not. But in a bigger scheme of things, it's important that there's an added value to the city as a whole. Uh, they need to be well communicated. This is where Milk can, can help you. And uh, I have experienced that firsthand through the process of making this book, because as an architect, I have done a lot of research and I have written quite a lot. I love writing. But having worked with Milk, with a professional editor, with illustrator, with graphic designer, bring it all together, um, the outcome, I hope, if you read through the book, is, is, uh, is to me, you know, it really has elevated and taken uh, the content to a different level, so, so it's really important. Um, engage relevant specialists, so uh, particularly developers are not best placed to run the meanwhile project, so when I mentioned Global Generation Charity running Skip Garden at King's Cross, you know, well done, Arjun had realized, you know, we want a community garden, but we're not the best place to run it. So, you know, get the right people, build partnerships with charities, NGOs, citizens' initi initiatives, etc., uh, who can run those projects, who can be the stewards of the project, because otherwise, if you just build it and you hope that somebody will take care of it, it usually uh, nosedives very, very quickly, because you can't expect of sort of 
day-to-day -day residents to be managing your project. People have jobs and mortgages and so on. So there, there needs to be um, an, own, an owner, there needs to be an ownership of, of the project. Uh, it's really useful to evaluate them over time, especially if you are dealing with a large, um, large site or, or a quarter, and you know, especially if you are a local authority and you want to see whether you are investing in the right types of initiatives. And yeah, just making sure that, however temporary and meanwhile it is, that there is actually the long-term value because that's why you are doing it. You know, either it changes people's behavior that they start cycling more or they start eating less or whatever, eating less meat, <laughs> and so on. So um, thank you very much. And uh, I mentioned a free digital copy online. Few copies, hard copies here in the future, hopefully, second run, uh, print run very soon. And I really look forward to the next presentations and discussion. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Petra. And love, speaking of stewardship and partnerships, and we are very lucky in Budapest to have uh, some organizations that have been in the last decade very active in building uh, public spaces, and we have. Here with us, Tilly Lohas, and I would ask her to tell us a little bit about your project in the last uh, years. So, thank you for inviting us. So, I will talk about what happened meanwhile in Budapest um, and actually show what uh, did uh, YO between uh, 2017 and uh, 2023, actually. Um, so, first of all, I would like to go back that it's always very important in what political context we are interfering, and it's really influenced the, also the actions, the scope of actions of our organizations. This is the two mayors we are uh, active, uh, and the first one was uh, for nine years since we uh, started our work and it was so-called uh, conservative uh, politician, whatever it means in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, and, uh, and in 2019 we had an election and the uh, representative of Green Party became a mayor and I chose this picture because uh, he has a very complicated coalition background and he also ran the city in one of the most complicated situations in this century during the pandemic and in the current biggest uh, economical crisis. Uh, so, and I also wanted to show them because it is always important, we say like there is a political um, will to do something and it's really influenced also our work. Uh, so, actually, the, the Liberty Bridge uh, project, which you mentioned before, uh, still happened during the so-called conservative uh, period. Um, and it was uh, thanks to a reconstruction. Uh, there was a reconstruction in the city, and then we saw that actually pe people just really loved uh, this place. And I made a Facebook event, and then many people just uh, come there. And uh, later on, in the next uh, three years, we lobbied the, the mayor that actually this is so nice that uh, uh, it would be really necessary for the city that it is also for the weekends, because at the beginning it was for two months, as you know, but then for three years it went on uh, for, uh, for four weekends, so that was how far we could get uh, with the mayor. And uh, it was uh, absolutely donation based because, for example, we were on a blacklist of the municipality, so we could actually do it, but we didn't get any support uh, from the city. So it was really just uh, coming grassroots, and we were just uh, organizing and coordinating the programs that it gets as diverse uh, as uh, possible. And uh, then came the pandemic which, uh, and also the political change, let's call it like this, in the, in the city life, and uh, the pandemic and the whole uh, public space uh, issue got in a very different perspective, and we, we wanted to keep on going with our ideas, but uh, um, everything changed, and uh, so
so that's why in 2020 it happened for the first time that the, the whole embankment along the Danube just got opened uh, because this was a trend in many other cities and, uh, and then it somehow kind of happened that it was also in Budapest like this, only for the weekends again. Um, and then uh, I still would like to highlight that uh, we had some uh, leisure time parks, but they were also still thanks to reconstruction works. So that's why it was possible to uh, close down from the cars certain areas, because there were some reconstructions in the city. And uh, that's why uh, we managed to do some of the tactical tours, to put uh, plans and make uh, temporary uh, sport uh, grounds. Uh, and like to change the whole area. And uh, this is the Pest site, if you remember, this was in 2021, and we were kind of uh, experimenting the first time on such big scale uh, in the city, how we can uh, to, trans uh, to change a certain area with the different tools. Uh, this is uh, uh, one of my favorites, when we kind of rethink uh, the actual the, the barriers of the city. So this is a well-known piece of uh, metal in the city, which usually is between cars and people. And that's why it's a very symbolic action as well to put uh, benches and chairs on these uh, areas. Uh, so, and then the next year it was again uh, for, uh, for reconstruction reasons, because the chain bridge uh, is under reconstruction, and that's why the Buddha side, uh, which is the like, uh, more green and the hilly side, and from the traffic perspective, is more tricky to close down. Uh, but because of this reason, um, it was again a possibility for more than a kilometer long area to create a recreational park with uh, very low budget uh, tools and, um, and um, to create such a place. Uh, and I didn't mention that uh, this could happen only with uh, like a stronger cooperation with the municipality. So in the beginning I was showing the guys. Uh, so there was a more openness from the municipality and also a financial support from the city level and also from the district level. Um, yeah, and uh, an example. Uh, that when we open places, uh, very often we try to focus on the tactic that we keep it as open as possible because when people uh, start to see the place, it actually inspires them what can happen there. So this is a very good example that a fencing championship just came out from a small stadium and went on the street. And this happened on one of the Saturday afternoon. Uh, and also uh, highlight some of the things that we actually also just learning by doing. So this was the first time we were cooperating with uh, like painting the, the concrete. But again, as we did this first time uh, in our work, of course, we had to remove it. But there was no uh, know how how to re re remove it. So it took us uh, like. Um, several phone calls and contacts and actually we had to find somebody in the country who was able to remove it. So there are always these like, small tricks, so it looks very nice and very fancy, but there are a lot of small details that we can actually realize such projects. Because in one week the cars were coming back and of course this wouldn't stay there. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, that uh, the previous projects were actually always because of some restructuring works, and I think it's a new step that uh, this happened just last weekend. Uh, that one of the area is actually already a first step for uh, midterm changes on the whole Danube embankment, when in cooperation with the municipality and the main gardening company, they were planting. Um, these uh, trees, um, they're still not like with the, with the roots, uh, but it's the first step to change the area. And um, actually, this is, yeah, this is my other presentation. I had two more slides. So 
So for that, I wanted to, there is no picture of that, but I wanted to highlight something, uh, the tourism issue, uh, because this area, which we are changing at the moment, uh, is actually at the moment mostly visited by tourists. So actually we are creating a place where the tourists are there and we need to invite the locals there. So this is very interesting because at other spots of the city usually the locals are there and the area gets interesting and the tourists came in and we have a bit of twisted uh, situation here. And I think this is something which we need to consider when developing the area. And okay, the last picture is like uh, always there is a question of who is going to go there because it's too sunny, nobody is going to use it uh, because it's too hot in the summer. So, but this year we managed to have this almost three meters tall uh, Laurus nobilis, which already gives sh shadow in 11 a.m. So you can try it, they are already there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Julie. Sorry for the mixing up the presentations. Actually, I met Petra first a few weeks ago in Koshitsa, where my presentation was mixed up, so this is when I get back, it's my karma point. You mentioned to me that uh, somehow the closure of the embankment happened, and I think there's somebody among us who made that happen, partly, so, uh, because things don't just happen by themselves, I guess. And also you mentioned a lot about working with the municipality, so we thought maybe Sean, you want to say a few words. Sean was the head of uh, the mayor's cabinet, uh, and he's been behind a lot of changes when it comes to mobility and access to public space. Yeah, thank you, and uh, there was some misunderstanding today, so I didn't make a presentation, unfortunately. But uh, the challenge to me, if I can uh, tell all these things in five minutes, so uh, now I have to be short. So, first of all, you already heard a lot of things about, for example, the, the new environment. I will tell you a few thoughts about what we do and why we do, but in the bigger picture. So Budapest is uh, suffering from people moving out. This city lost 300,000 people in a few decades, while the, the agglomeration around us is growing. And according to the statistics, this will continue, and it's going to be very hard because every day we saw this, those people again in Budapest because they are coming here to work for, for uh, I don't know, for to study, to take their children to study and do other stuff. So. We live together with the agglomeration, and um, it's a really tough situation. It's not a mobility problem. When we want to solve it with mobility, we will see it's not going to happen. There is this governmental plan to invest, if I'm correct, 10 billion euros in uh, suburban railways. It's enormous, and even the governmental um, plan says, okay, they will double the number of passengers on the train, but the number of cars will increase. So it's not a solution. If we spend 10 million euros and we will get more cars, that, well, that's not, not a very good solution. We have to look behind the, these trends and we see it's not about mobility uh, alone. It's also about housing and uh, livable neighborhoods. Why, why are people moving out? Because they cannot afford that kind of uh, living standards that they are looking for. It's not green enough here. It's not, uh, 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 the housing is, uh, is very high price and stuff, so they are moving out. So we, if we want to keep Budapest how it is now or how it can be in the future, we have to uh, tackle these, uh, these uh, kind of issues. But we have no one. Uh, I think it's kind of, kind of common in cities, but uh, I believe it's even worse in Budapest because our fight with the government so we cannot invest in building houses, uh, we cannot invest in building big projects. What we can do is what is left for us, it's urban space. And we can transform this and we can create a more livable city with, with no money. And if you have no money, then if you are still brave enough, then you can transform a city. And that's why we are doing all of this. Like, uh, okay, this is already done uh, with Bartok uh, Boulevard, but uh, the Grand Boulevard around the city centre 
uh, where we took off one lane and, and transformed it to a bike lane. What we are doing in the, the Danube embankment that uh, we are transforming slowly and slowly but to a passive and uh, walking uh, urban space. And so on. all of these projects are going towards a goal where this city is uh, livable, lovable for people living here. The aim of our uh, city strategy is uh, Otto Budapest, is living in, in Budapest city. So we want to uh, give the opportunity for people working here, living here, studying here, doing anything here, to live here and enjoy the city. So, so all of this is because of this, and that's the goal. Thanks for Thanks. 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 Thanks a lot. Um, so it shows that technical urbanism is not only a tool, but sometimes it's a necessity. When you have no more money, then you, the only thing you can do is step by step build uh, temporary projects and and then work towards a long term solution where you have to convince a lot of people. So it's, it's this discussion is happening these days actually in Budapest and in many cities how to turn temporary interventions into long term structural change. We have also Aaron with us who wants to say a few words. Uh, you know, I also challenge Aaron to tell us in five minutes about what he thinks about good public spaces. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to be quick because you know all this story. Um, this is Grand Boulevard or Ring, uh, the bike lanes that Sean just mentioned. I brought some data um, to put this in context. So before COVID, before the temporary bike lanes, we had around like some hundred people are cycling here, they were cycling on, on the sidewalks, they were cycling between the mirrors of cars, there were some of them were cycling on the tram lines, I did it many times. Um, and now I, I just got some data from BKK, from the transport company, that we have, in May we had days with 3,000 people cycling here, those were the weekdays, with trains and, and, and bad weather, and we had more than 5,000 people cycling here. On, on better days, and I think this is kind of a big achievement for, for a very cheap uh, investment. And, uh, and I know that it has its weaknesses. Uh, there is this issue with parking on the bike lane, which is because of the lack of uh, city logistics infrastructure, the parking spaces for, for trucks, um, and the lack of enforcement. And there is this problem with the um, with, um, driving on the bike lane, which is the behavior issue, it sometimes happens, but still it created a safer place for people to cycle. And um, maybe we can change, yeah. <laughs> but I, I know that we, we would like to see better bicycle infrastructure, and it always comes up in discussions that why are our bicycle lanes not separated and protected and separated with some, some plants or curbs or I don't know, big concrete walls, and I know that it would be the perfect solution because it would create a more sense of safety for more people. Um, and we always have this kind of um, discussions in, in the city hall with districts, with uh, transport companies that um, why is it not possible or how it would be possible to create these kind of uh, more perfect uh, situations. And, um, and I think that, of course, yeah, this is very, very important to have this kind of infrastructure and uh, it would create a more sense of safety for more people, even more people. But I would like to bring here a question or, or something food for thought for, for the discussion that maybe we should create a network first if, if we have the possibility, if we have the possibility to uh, get some, gain some quick wins um, if we can do something to paint only, then we should do it because we don't have really enough money. If we have enough money and we have enough space and we have enough political view, there are some districts who have that, uh, then of course we should do the, the perfect uh, ideas, but maybe we should go for the network first. And this is not only my idea, I was at the Velocity Conference in, in uh, Germany and someone from Berlin was saying exactly the same thing. that. Uh, they evaluate projects on uh, implementation speed, the gaps in network, and the, and the safety issues, and uh, and they and they go for network first, even if it's just paint only. Um, and the reason why I'm saying this is because we have lots of gaps in the network 
for cycling. Um, I have this bicycle network plan on or map on my wall, and I was just checking out where we have the biggest gaps, and <laughs> yeah, there are some. So uh, my 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 question or my thought here would be, um, or my conclusion that I I think I can say that we should have more temporary uh, solutions or quick wins, and then it will create. Um, a bigger number of people using bikes in cities that would lead to the perfect solutions because if we would always uh, wait for the perfect solutions we would lose the momentum for it um, thank you very much that was it thanks a lot Aaron. so before i give you over for questions i will invite all our speakers to join me on this fabulous chairs